It'll be, yep, see the little live up in the corner. Okay. All right, guys, so today's roundtable discussion, this is Ben from Wise Men Company and Noah from Wise Men Company. We're holding a roundtable discussion on deciding your EDC. Today we have Rex from Kentucky Carry. We have Drew from Drew Hopkins on IG, and we have Ryan from Embrace the Recoil on IG. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Good, good, good to have you. All right, let's get right into it. And this is going to be a general question to the entire uh, group. It's going to be the same question, so we'll just go right down the line. We'll start with you, Rex, first, and then move to Drew, and then to Ryan. So the question is, how long have you been carrying a gun? What was making that decision to carry like? Was it difficult? Uh, was it just kind of ingrained from you, like that's what men do, carry a gun? How long have you been carrying a gun? Rex, you go first. <laughs> I honestly don't know how long I've been carrying a gun. It hasn't been like, hasn't been like super long, super long. Um, but it's just something I've always wanted to do. Wanted to do. Uh, um, man, there's a bad egg. Bad egg. Sorry. Hey, what's up, Sorry. What's up, bro? Um, um, anyway, I'm gonna try anyway, to I'm gonna try to ignore it. Uh, uh. I have been. I have been. I can't ignore. Can't ignore. Hold on. Hold on. Who's headphones? Who's headphones? Yo, Rex. Pop your Rex. Pop your earphones out. Now just just talk into the mic. Mic. All right. Try. Try. That's better. What was your question? Your question. Besides, how long have I been? How long have I been? Was it a tough was decision to decide to carry a gun? No, I definitely, no, I definitely wasn't. I was raised in a I program. Raised in a program. I was raised in a family. I was raised in a family that protect yourself, protect yourself, protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. And so for me, so for me, this is opportunity. Opportunity. I wouldn't. Okay. Are, okay. are, are any of you are watching, any of you watching YouTube? Your YouTube? I'm trying to figure out where the trying to figure out where the feedback's coming. Are any of you watching? Are any of you watching this on YouTube? Nope. Is All it right. still there? Is it still there? Rex, say something. Rex, say something. Yep. Yep. All right, Drew, go ahead. Right, answer Drew, the go ahead. Answer the question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I've been carrying for about um, ten years. Turned twenty-one. I uh, got an MMP as a gift, and I've been carrying ever since. Um, it was pretty casual the first few years, and the main reason I was carrying it was because I was on a college campus. Um, you know, there was anti-gun stickers everywhere, you know, but there was never a uh, security guard or a cop to be seen, ever. And uh, I just, you know, I didn't feel safe, so um, I carried, and I did that for a long time. Um, See, it probably wasn't until about the past year that I started taking it really seriously and making sure that no matter where I went, I was carrying. Um, so yeah, uh, it probably hasn't been until the past um, six or seven months that I started training really hard, like every day, um, in my ability to draw from concealment and stuff like that. So um, that what, your was your was your family really into guns? Like, did that? Well, I'm from Western Kentucky, so uh, yeah, we were. Um, my dad has always been big into guns, and I grew up hunting, grew up um, target shooting, stuff like that. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's pretty much a family thing. No one else in my family is like that, though. It's just me and my parents. Uh, the rest of my family is very much in the opposite direction. So. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Ryan, uh, same question uh, to you. Same question to you. Uh, yeah, I've been carrying for. Uh, it'll be 10 years this weekend, actually. My birthday is Friday, so I bought a gun on my birthday when I turned 21. I filed to get my permit uh, a couple weeks later. It took me, I think, three or four months to get it, but then since then I've been carrying ever since. I, I'm kind of like Drew where I've been real serious about it probably the last couple months of actually like running snap cap drills and timing drills and stuff like that, but I've always carried a gun 
for the last 10 years when I go out and about most of the time. It's just it's second nature to me. I wanted to carry a gun for a long time. My family, my family is there's no gun there's no gun people in my family. In my family. It's, it's just something that I don't know. It just I don't know. It just me. happened for me. Uh, uh, you know, my 21st you know, birthday was a big deal. It was a big deal when it came to getting a pistol. So I was excited. I was excited. Hmm. Okay. All right, next question is uh, specifically for Drew. Um, on your IG, it seems like you, you shoot a lot of different handguns. You have a lot of different models. Um, which one gets carried the most and why? Um, Glocks get carried the most. Um, and honestly, it is a split between my 19 and my 43. Okay, um, why is that? It's because I wear two different types of clothing throughout the week. Um, it's out of casual, and with casual wear, I wear a 19 because I can print a little bit more and no one notices. Um, also, I feel more comfortable with the Glock 19. It's just a larger uh, firearm than a 43. Um, I believe it's still considered a compact, but it you know it, it, it feels like a full-size handgun. Um, carries more rounds, and I'm just better with it all rounds. What do you uh, have on you right now? I have my 19 on me right now. Well, let's see it. Bring it up. Let's see it. Okay. All right. Well, here, I'll just raise up. Okay. So this is my 19. Um, it's a Gen 4. This is not a uh, totally stock Glock 19. Um, the slide is normal. The uh, sights are normal. But everything else on it is different. Um, I've got um, a new trigger job on this thing. It's made by Glock Craft. Um, Overwatch Precision, if you know them now. Let's see, what else do I got? Um, I've had a... Sorry, barrel. Yep, I've got a thread barrel on there because I'm hoping to go suppress sometime in the next year or so just, just for fun. Um, it's F, S3F Solutions makes this barrel. Um, I haven't barrel. noticed a huge difference. I do shoot at long range a lot just, just for fun, like 100 yards or so. So it does make it a little bit easier. Um, but uh, I mainly just got it for the threads. And okay. uh, I've got a whole frame and stipple job that was done by um, this guy by, named Nick, NAF Solutions out of Florida. Awesome guy to work with. So, yeah, this is what I carry pretty much every single day. Um, if I don't carry this, it's my 43, and that's just because I can conceal it really well in uh, dress and business attire. But for the most part, I do I do carry this. So Okay, very cool. Hey, Ben, real yeah. quick. Um, if you could uh, try just tapping on the screen of the person that's talking uh, um, down below, I think mm -hmm. it might pop them up. Uh, um, it's not allowing me to do it, so you may want to try that. Okay. Um, this next question is going to uh, Rex, uh, and that is, Rex, you ride a motorcycle. Uh, you can see that from your IG. Uh, I would imagine that would dictate what you carry on a daily basis, riding a motorcycle. Does that, does your EDC change when you get on your motorcycle? If so, what changes about it? Um, for me, uh, I try to make sure I can do just about everything with my regular EDC. I, I'm, I'm real big on consistency, so uh, what I carry on the bike is what I carry every day. Um, that's one of the big reasons why I carry appendix, because you know, on a bike, you know, you may kill yourself trying to reach for a gun when it's moving, anyways. So, right. it, but ideally, you know, if if you have to do that, any kind of lean will, you know, take you down. You know, so um, I always try to to carry consistently so I can do it. So I work, carry appendix um, just because that's that's the best chance you have of being able to draw the weapon. Okay, very cool. Um, when you uh, when you first start started riding, um, was it uncomfortable with everything or is it just kind of like, well, I have it on me and I'm just going to ride the bike? Is Was that it, just kind of... It was kind of uncomfortable because when I first started riding, I carried at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Mm. Um, which is, it's really weird feeling on the bike. Uh, I know guys that do it all the time, but for me, it was like I just felt like it was super exposed. Um, and part of that is because I'm 6'7", and T-shirts for me, uh, they turn into belly shirts really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, this guy's huge. So, you know, it's like... It's about I, my size. <laughs> I have to be very careful with, you know, where my gun placement is, because, you know, if I bend over, you know, the shirt rides up halfway up my back. So, yeah. you know, I, I always try to keep it in the front, because, you know, another part of my my life is I'm around kids a lot and you know a kids are ornery and if they see something they'll grab for it so if it's in front I, I can see it and I know where it's at I can protect it. Okay very cool. Uh, Alright next is for Ryan. No I'm gonna go ahead and uh, present to everyone right? 
Yeah, and actually just click on their photo. You don't need to do present. Uh, um, okay, there we go. Just, just click on the photo. Okay, so Ryan, this one's for you. How did you end up choosing the M&P as your carry gun? I mean, you, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, just kind of go into depth. Was it a tough decision, or is it kind of just love at first sight? You guys hear me? Yep. Yes. No, now we can't. <laughs> yes, we can. No, we can't. Why does it keep going away? There we go. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, between... I carried a Glock 27 for probably three years, and then when I wanted to go into full size, I just assumed I'd move into a Glock. Um, but when I went to actually look at them, I looked at the M&P and the Glock, and the way that... Um, I'm not even sure if M&P still come like it now, but the back straps can be switched out. There's a small, medium, and large yeah. size yeah. hand grip. Um, and just the feel of the M&P in my hand was better than the Glock, so I bought the M&P. I mean, that really was the... Because I'm super big into how it feels in my hand when it comes to um, handling the recoil, so that's why I went with that one. So sure. what is your feeling on the trigger on the M&P? <laughs> uh, good and bad. I mean, honestly, I... You know, it's one of those things where you love what you have, so, it, you know, it's something that I've just grown accustomed to, um, but it doesn't mean I'm outside of probably getting a, you know, a trigger at some point, but everything I've ever shot and carried has always been stock, so, you know, gotcha. I just... With that said, I'm going to swing this back over to Rex. Uh, did you touch your trigger on your M&P at all, or no? I ripped it out the day I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. I went from a 1911 trigger oh, to the yeah. M&P, so I just instantly threw up when I shot it. So, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, click I definitely the, click I, the photo, Ben. I definitely got an Apex uh, the day I bought the gun. Yeah, okay. that's what I'm looking at. Okay, very cool. Um, all right, next is to the entire group, and we'll work our way down the line again. We'll start with uh, Rex. Uh, day in and day out, what is the most used item in your EDC? You have uh, to actually use it, so don't say it's your smoke wagon because you're not killing people day in and day out. So. <laughs> That's my least used item, um, but it's the one I play with the most. Uh, it's either, honestly, uh, it's probably uh, this, uh, moleskin notebook and a pen, or, you know, the, the skeletal, you know, this little yeah, pocket knife. Good. Those are the two things I use more than anything else. Very cool. All right, Drew? Um, I mean, I would have to say my gun because I do shoot every day, but um, yeah. uh, probably my flashlight, believe it or not. I've just got a cheap little Streamlight ProTag 2L. Yeah, that's what um, I got. Got it as a gift, and, you know, I was in the market for a flashlight, and it's actually held up really well. I've had it for over a year, and I've, I've beat it up, and... Um, but I live out in the absolute middle of nowhere, which is why I'm streaming from outside, and I'm always around darkness. It, I mean, it's everywhere. I have one light on the outside of my house, and I think the nearest light is probably about 10 miles away. So I'm in dark buildings at night whenever I'm at work and driving around. I'm, at, I'm in the dark whenever I come home at night, so exactly. I use this thing all the time. Very cool, man. Yeah, I got the same light. I love it. Um, Mine's been through the wash like five times and it's still going. <laughs> uh, it's it's great. The they're, the clips suck on them. That's why I always put the uh, zip tie on it. And everyone always asks me why I have a zip tie on it. But um, those those lights run forever and they're not expensive. Uh, Ryan, what is the most used item? Honestly, I really don't touch too much of my EDC. My EDC is really pretty simple. But I mean, I would probably have to say my knife. You know, for random stuff. But you know, outside of what I have, you know, I don't touch my gun day to day unless I'm doing um, shooting and or dry fire. So, okay, probably my knife. All right. Um, let's see who we got up next. Oh, Rex, here we go. A lot of folks might criticize carrying a wheel gun, uh, but you do from time to time. What are some of the reasons why you carry it and uh, why you like it? Um, I primarily carry it as a backup. Uh, if I do carry it, uh, just because, you know, New York Reload, it's fast. Yeah, yeah you <laughs> can't beat it. Uh, but um, if I do carry it as my main weapon, it's just because I have to go ultralight deep concealment. That's, I mean, I'm sure there are, there are automatics that would do it better, but it just, it, it's solid, it's reliable. Um, but I will say that, you know, if a revolver doesn't work, you're really not going to fix it. 
Right, so, right, 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 right. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to what uh, Drew said with the 43. It's just sometimes you just need more concealability. You just have to have it. And you might sacrifice rounds, but it's better than having nothing. So. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on. Drew, what was the first carry gun you ever bought? Do you still have it? Was it a good decision? Uh, it was an M&P. Oh, first one I bought or first one I ever had? Bought. Bought. First one I ever bought was... Spent your own money on it. Oh, my own money. It was my, uh, it was my Glock 19. Okay. Um, and uh, I just... My dad got a Glock. I tried it out. I loved it. I thought, you know, I might as well get one. And uh, and I did. And I loved it. And I switched from an M&P to that. Still love my M&P. But, um, you know, Glock's my... It just feels better. It's like Ryan said. It just it just feels better, and I'm a big believer in carrying whatever is comfortable, regardless of what other people say about it. Sure. And you still have it, right? You have the same 19. Yeah. It's what I, yeah, it's what I got on. So yeah. In, it's in your pants. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um. All right. Uh. Ryan. Uh, Where's God? You 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 don't carry a light. Is there a reason why? Would you ever carry a light? Um. What do you think about that? I hate stuff in my pockets, um, and like Drew said, like he deals with dark a lot. I never deal with dark. If if I felt I was going into situations, which I know there's going to be people that say, you never know when power, blah, 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 but if I felt I was going into situations like that where it would come into play, I would carry a flashlight. But I, I also think, you know, a lot of the times when I think of a, like a CPL scenario, a flashlight in my pocket is going to be the last thing that comes to my mind, you know, if that is what's needed, you're going to go to your gun. So if I think if I was to carry a flashlight, I would probably carry a flashlight that was on my gun rather than one that I carried in my pocket. I was going to ask, so you, you'd be perfectly cool with a weapon-mounted light then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to jump in here real quick. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Nope, I'm done. Go ahead. I'm going to jump in, actually. Uh, we actually got a question here on YouTube. Uh, um, from uh, from uh, Marcus, and he said, "What are your thoughts on carrying a tactical flashlight for self-defense, where carrying a firearm or a defensive knife uh, is not allowed, uh, um, or do you have other suggestions?" Okay, so he's talking about a non-permissive environment. Correct. Um, so uh, obviously, does anyone want to take it? Does anyone want to field it? They have a good. Okay, Drew, you got you're up, baby. Yeah. Um, I, I work uh, in youth nonprofit, and before that I was a youth pastor, and so I went into schools a lot. Um, you just can't carry in school, plain and simple. It doesn't matter, I mean, how, how, how much we want it, it's just not going to happen, and I'm not going to break a law like that, especially at a school. So I would say, in terms of a tactical light for self-defense purposes, carry whatever you possibly freaking can uh, into those places that don't allow anything else. Um, in the worst case scenario, is it going to save your life? Probably not, but at least you got something. It's better than nothing. So that's my opinion on it. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people like to think of their flashlight as an impact tool. That's why they get like ex like really heavy bezels on them and things like that. Um, I don't know, going up against a gun, how effective that's going to be. I know in a dark situation, uh, if you have a light, especially with a strobe or like a very high lumen output, if you can take away someone's vision, at the least it buys you time. Um, but I haven't taken any courses on using a flashlight as an impact weapon. I mean, Noah might be able to answer this a little bit better than most of us. Noah, did you have anything to say about it? Well, did anybody else have anything they wanted to add before I say anything? What was the actual question? Uh, use of a flashlight in self-defense? Well, when a the, gun isn't permitted. Yeah, when the the what are your thoughts on carrying a flashlight for self-defense when you might not be able to carry a firearm or a knife? And then, did you have any suggestions either? I think um, about the flashlight or something other than a flashlight for non-permissive environments. Okay. No, go ahead. So. In uh, in my opinion, and and uh, in, in talking again with some of the people that I've trained with, you know, the flashlight, believe it or not, is probably pretty close to my most used EDC item. So I would highly recommend carrying one. 
I, I can't tell you how many times something gets dropped on the floor and the carpet that I'm down there with the flashlight trying to find stuff or I'm underneath the couch. But, you know, I got four kids, a dog, two cats, and you can't believe, you know, sometimes I'm scared to go under the couch with a flashlight. <laughs> uh, in As far as the self-defense use, try and find a uh, somebody who teaches martial arts that uses uh, striking tools as part of the martial art. Uh, talk to them about that. There are a lot of really good options out there. Um, you know, the great thing about a flashlight is unless you get one of the ones that are super tacked out with the bezel that looks like it's designed for skewering pigs, <laughs> um, the reality is you can carry a flashlight just about anywhere and nobody's going to think a thing about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can think of even just in the Colorado shooting incident, uh, uh, you know, you might not have a... The movie theater, you're talking about the movie theater. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, somebody who'd had a flashlight or a couple of guys that had, had a flash uh, flashlights that had the strobe feature, and you can debate back and forth whether the strobe is, is actually an effective thing or, or not. Uh, uh, but just a, you know, somebody who'd had a 300 lumen flashlight or a 150 lumen flashlight nailed that kid right in the eyes while somebody else came at him and took him out at the legs. Somebody probably would have got shot, but most likely a lot fewer of the people in the theater would have gotten shot in that kind of a situation. So am I recommending that you go out and you know, try and stop somebody with a gun with a flashlight? Absolutely not. But I do think that it, you know, it's a great question and it's certainly a viable option. Uh, um, and as far as other for non-permissive, uh, uh, you know, again, I don't have a lot of experience with pepper spray or things like that. Uh, but you can find training out there. Even talk to some of your local law enforcement agents. Uh, um, a lot of them have had training and would be more than happy to help you out with something like that. Yep. Um, if I can just make some suggestions on lights, a lot of the beefier ones out there, Surefire is going to be your strongest. Uh, yeah, they're expensive, but they are built like a brick shit house, and they, I mean, as far as an impact tool, they're going to take a beating before they turn off. So if that's what you're looking for, like, if that is your only option as a light, and that's why you're asking the question, I'd pick a Surefire. Uh, but let's move on to the next question. This is for the entire group, uh, and definitely be honest on this one. How often do you conceal carry from the time you wake up, from the time you go to sleep? How often is that? Is it on 90% of the time, 100% of the time? Rex, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Dude, I, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, I have it on. Like, that's just... If I, I, I'm consistent, you know, I, I'm one of those few people that, you know, you'd, if you check me, I'd have everything you see in all those pictures all the time. Huh. Very cool. Drew? Hey, same here. Um, I think it's fun. Like, whenever I get up, I'm like, I gotta go put my gun on. Like, that's, that's just that's just how I am. Whenever I'm, you know, getting ready to go to bed, I'm usually dry firing, so I have it on me. <laughs> and, uh, um... And my M&P rests beside me. You know, it's the old, the old M&P it rests beside me. But um, in terms of my EDC, yeah, man, it stays on all the time. So. Very cool. Ryan? Um, I would say when I'm home, I have guns around the house. So I, I wouldn't say that I carry a ton when I'm in the house. Like, I'm sitting at my work desk right now, and I have a Beretta, like, tucked into the desk. So when I'm downstairs, if I have, like, if I come downstairs, there's a gun down here. So I don't necessarily carry because I do a lot of work in the shop where, it's just, it's kind of pointless when there's guns right next to me. Um, you know, I sleep with a gun next to the bed, but when I'm out in public, I would say it's like 90% of the time. But at home, there's guns everywhere, so, you know, I don't necessarily keep it on my person. Okay. Very cool. Um, next question. Is there, uh, this is to the whole group, is there a piece of gear that you don't have that you're really looking forward to adding to your setup? And then tell us about it. There's got to be that one piece that's like, I'm going to have to spend some money for that. Uh, we'll start with you, Rex. Ah, oh, man. Let's go somebody else. Give me a second. All right, Drew. <laughs> uh, well, I just I just dropped some money on my 43. I wanted to get some framework and some stippling done on it. Um, Typically what I do, eventually, if, I'm, if I know I'm going to carry a gun for a long time, I'm going to dip that thing in some, like, 
uh, detergent or something, something to make it slick, get my hands wet, and shoot with it. And that little tiny G3, as much as it, G43, as much as it shoots like a Glock 19, it is still super tiny and hard to hold on to. So um, I sent that off um, a few days ago to get some grip work done. So I just dropped some bones on that. Um, I don't think there's anything else I'd spend money on. People tell me I need to get a knife. If I'm going to get a get one, I need to spend <laughs> spend the money for a good one. But I suck with knives, and I'd rather just use my hands. Yeah. So uh, knife hands, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I just I'm I'm not good with knives. I'd be more of a liability. So I, I don't think there's anything else I'd, I'd spend money on right now. At least uh, but you, I mean, you do carry a Gerber multi tool though. Like that has a yeah. knife in it. Yeah, like I have a knife I mean, to cut knife things, to cut but not a knife to cut knife people to cut. with. Right. Yeah. Like, pokey, pokey pokey stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe a weapon yeah. line. I have to get a new holster. Two years. Two years. Two years from, so I don't I don't know. Okay. All right, Ryan. Um, nothing really for me. I mean, since I started this journey, I in the last month and a half, I've bought a holster, a gun, a belt, a rubber dummy. So I've really spent the money on a lot of this stuff. Uh, I guess the big one, I wanted the shield, um, the M&P shield, mm -hmm. and I just bought that because I had the M&P full size and then I had the bodyguard, and the trigger on the bodyguard is garbage, so I wanted a, a smaller gun that had a better trigger, so I bought the shield. So, so, I you, say, got, so you got a Smith & Wesson, but another Smith hey, & Wesson. I don't, hey, when you run the trigger as much as I do, you don't complain about it. Now, if I switch to something else, I might have been like, oh, damn, I've been missing out my whole life, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, wa I wanted something that was kind of in between, so more rounds, better trigger, but not as big. But I don't have a holster for it yet, so I guess you could say that I want to get a sidecar for it. So you're okay. Uh, Rex, you thinking anything? Yeah, I've been jonesing for a, an RMR, like real bad. And I'll have, ah. I'll have two ways on me, like every every day about getting one. <laughs> you mean so, are, are you gonna get it for your handgun? Yeah, I, what I'd like to do is find a, uh, the M&P Pro Core slide and just kind of have two slides that I can switch out. That's a good um, idea. But they're like crazy expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so, they, yeah they are expensive. Um, but those RMRs, they last forever. They're like heirloom red dots, man. Like they're tough to break. I've shot them quite a bit. I think dots, red dots are eventually the future on handguns. Everyone's going to that just like it was on, on carbines. Um, it really helps at really distance. Helps. Like if you ever get to shoot a dot on a handgun at distance, it's like cheating. It's it makes it so easy. But yeah, that's that's a good one. An RMR on a gun, I think that's a good one. Plus, I've got a I've got a buddy who's uh his eyes aren't so great anymore, and they keep getting ah, yeah. and uh, he refuses to wear his glasses. <laughs> so I'm like, they're just getting the RMR and be done yeah. with it. You can't yeah. see sights. <laughs> what's what's that? condition some people have it's with their eyes like stigmatism or something where they can't they have to use both eyes or something and they need the red dot really helps with that or something I piece of shit at me um, okay so this next question is the final question that I have and it's for the entire party what does the second amendment mean to you so Rex do you want to start sure um, okay. ultimately I was thinking about this earlier today and Ultimately, I think it's about protecting the people from the government. You know, people like to say it's for self-defense, it's for hunting, it's for whatever. But ultimately, yeah, all those things are good. But it's ultimately to protect us from the government because right. it's if the government abuses the people, you know, what other option do we have? If you know the government says we don't care about your legal options, it's right. for the people to defend themselves. So I think that's ultimately what it means for me. Okay, great answer, Drew. Um. Yeah, this is a tough question to actually narrow down, but um, you know, I think that um, we could all agree that regardless of whether or not you're an American, just as a human being, you have a life, you have a right to life and liberty. Um, and in my opinion, there are only two things that can take that away from you: that's other people or your government. And the Second Amendment is simply a law that backs up a truth that you have the right to hold on to those two things. Um, so. Um, that's what it means to me. Um, it's just a written document that my government, uh, from my government, that basically just says, "Hey, listen, you have the right to own whatever you need to own in order to protect your life and your liberty from okay. us or from other people." Okay, very cool. Ryan. Yeah, I think I kind of go in between the two of them. You know, I believe why I own guns is I think I made a post about this. Is it they level the playing field? So if 
if you are in a situation and you have a gun where you're fighting someone with a gun, you, you're an equal. Where if you don't have a gun, you know, you have to find someone that does. And, and I think everyone has the right to protect themselves, be it from the government or from other people. You know, you, for me, it's a way to be prepared, and I'm going to be prepared. You yeah. know, I think, it's, I think it's our right, and I think it's something that you should take time in and be proficient in. So if everything does go to hell, you know, you're not the one trying to get help. You're the one that can offer help. So. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, one time when I was younger, I ran into a pacifist, and uh, my brother was the one that actually posed the question. He said, okay, so if someone was busted into your house in the middle of the night and was trying to hurt your kids and rape your wife, you wouldn't defend your family? No, 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 no. I would just try to talk to them, and then I would call the police. Oh, you'd have the police come and use a gun to stop right. the threat. Like, I that just made no sense to me as a young guy. Like, that just doesn't compute. Like, you're just gonna have someone else do your dirty work. Um, so that just that story always resonates with me. It's uh, gun levels the playing field. Absolutely. Um, Noah, did you have anything else? Yeah, we got a couple of more questions here from from YouTube. Okay. Um, and uh, first of all, Marcus said uh, that he appreciates the answers. He's uh, uh, wanted to let everybody know that he's operating not so much out of a permissive environment as much as a permissive, uh, a non-permissive country. He's actually uh, in Sweden watching us. So, oh, wow. Wow. Hey, <laughs> shrimp on the Barbie. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, just ignore him if you're still watching, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of him. <laughs> But uh, from uh, um, uh, another uh, person, Extreme Survival TV, they wanted to know, and we kind of covered this, so I'm just going to throw it out there kind of quick, but your your thoughts on carrying a knife as a self-defense weapon, because they're actually in a state where you aren't permitted to carry a firearm. So I know, uh, uh, um, Drew, you kind of touched on the fact that you don't carry a knife for that reason, that you don't really know, uh, um, like you don't, don't feel safe or proficient with that. Uh, um, if you have anything else to add, or uh, uh, Ryan or Rex, if you have anything. I kind of, I mean, the, the way I look, when I carry a weapon, be it a knife or a gun, my mindset changes to backing down. So I'm not going to be the aggressor when it comes to things because I think when you carry a gun, you should do everything in your power to not start the fight because of the laws and things like that. And it's the same with a knife. Like, yes, when I used to not carry a gun, I'd carry a knife. But it's always, you know, violence is the last option. But if you're gonna use it, be good at it. So use everything you have. Yeah. Right. And it, the same. What I, my point is with the knife is, you know, you're you want to get out of the situation without having to get into it. But if you have to get into it, yeah, it's obviously better to have whatever you can have at your availability with you. Uh, Rex, you carry a, a TDI. I mean, so you carry a, a definitely a defensive blade. I mean, did you have any thoughts on the question posed? Yeah. Um, like, for me, I'm not a knife fighter. I'm not really a brawler. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the sheepdog mentality, but for me, I'm, I'm not. Like, I'm getting my family out. Like, you know, somebody's shooting up a Walmart. I'm not going to try to shoot them. I'm trying to get my wife to get out. Um, and so that's kind of my philosophy with the knife. Like, I'm if I have to pull the knife, I'm going to pull the gun. I'm not going to pull the knife first. Um, and my knife is strictly a last resort. Somebody has a hold of my weapon, and I need to retain the weapon. That's right. A get off me blade. Yeah, like I, I'm not, I'm not a knife fighter. Uh, don't have any training. That's why I picked the TDI because it's designed to. If you throw a punch, like you know, you're going to do the damage you need to do. Um, and I can throw a punch, so I mean that's that's really the only reason I carry it. Seven Rex, holy shit! <laughs> Freaking Yao Ming on the other end of this line. Um, <laughs> all right, Drew. So you kind of touched on that already. Um, that was a great question. Thank you to the guy that posted that. Who was that, Noah? Uh, that was uh, Extreme Survival TV. Real quick, I just wanted to kind of touch on that. Uh, uh, not knowing what state you're from. Uh, um, I can guess possibly New York or uh, California or one of the the uh, uh, communist republic states that we have the nine gun. Uh, the the difficulty with a knife uh, again. I have a very good friend who uh, has 
it can teach all of this stuff. Like the guy is like just scary, and he actually won't even teach knife uh, tactics to civilians at all because for law enforcement purposes, for legal purposes, a knife is considered an offensive weapon. It's not con whereas a firearm is considered a defensive weapon. I. Uh, the reason being is that you have to be up close and personal in order to use a knife and so it can be used as a last ditch effort uh, um, oh and he just said he's in Maryland uh, um, that's uh, it yeah um, and, <laughs> yeah time uh, <laughs> to move <laughs> so yes carry it because you can't carry a handgun but but be prepared that the legal ramifications that you're probably going to face if you ever have to use that is going to actually, there's a good chance it's going to be even more insurmountable than if you had to deploy your firearm just because you have to be up close. So you really need to be ready when if you've ever used that. Um, and again, I'm not a lawyer or anything like that, but you're really going to have to be ready to uh, justify that your life was an immediate danger from for death and yeah but, like I was, it's kind of a catch-22 because if it's a hand-to-hand -hand and you pull a knife you're the aggressor if it's a knife versus knife you really your best option is probably to get out of there or like you're saying it's a last ditch and if it's knife versus gun you're already up shit creek so <laughs> you know it, it's it's a very like like Noah's saying it's a very fine line where you're gonna be able to deploy that and have the justification you know to have used it so, yeah, have it, but you know it is it is a fine line for sure. And it's and it's tough because if you can, sh you freeze Noah. Noah froze. <laughs> Are the rest of you guys there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. His his screen's um, froze. Yeah, he'll get he'll pop right back on. Um, yeah, the knife. I wish I knew more. I totally do. Uh, I'm kind of in the Rex camp where like if I have to use it, um. I'll just stab you right in the eye, and that's about <laughs> the extent of my knife fighting skills. Oh, just plant in eye. Just do that. Okay. That's or just move out of Maryland and then... Oh, yeah, or just move out of Maryland and get a gun. Um, so, yeah. Uh, all right, well, when Noah comes back, we'll take some more questions. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry okay. about that. My dog just came over and uh, managed to turn off my internet, so... You got any more questions from anybody else? Yep, uh, there's a couple more here um, from EDC Training. Uh, um, oh, yeah. oh, I love that guy. And, love uh, that guy. His uh, are a little bit more specific, uh, um, not so much to uh, our EDC, but to our uh, uh, training with our EDC. And he wanted to know what dry fire drills uh, were running most often any specific ones that we run on a daily basis, and then why those specific drills? Uh, the the shot timer community of IG, either Drew or or Ryan, do you want to field this one? Sure. You can both go. You can go first, Drew. I'll wait. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I do dry fire drills every day. Um, some... Sometimes I do it longer than others. Sometimes I'll do it for an hour. Sometimes I'll do it for 10 minutes hard. Um, but a lot of times at the end of the day, I'll just sit there and watch an episode of Walking Dead while doing dry fire drills. And all I'm doing, the, the main purpose of it, is just to familiarize my muscles with the movement of drawing, um, the marriage, the presentation, and the pull. And that's it. I'm not trying to go super fast whenever I'm doing dry fire drills. Um, if you ever see me going fast doing dry fire dr drills, like if I post a video, it's only because I've worked up to that over the course of like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, dry fire is about doing it right, not doing it fast. So that's that's pretty much what I do. It's just nice and slow, nice and easy, um, making sure that uh, that front sight is directly where your eye is looking every time you present your firearm. That's the main thing I'm going for. So True. do you always do dry fire drills from the holster, or is it mixed up every time? Is it... Um, are you always pulling from the holster, or are you just you mix it up? I, I always do it from the holster. Um, now I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. I mean, if you want to start at you know, um, you know, on the marriage, or if you want to just present, yeah, and pull, present and pull, that's awesome too. But I always do it from the holster. Um, 
I do it with one hand. I do it with an off hand, which is ugly. Yeah. Um, I do it. Uh, How come we both? never see those videos? That's <laughs> everybody hey. wants to show the sub one second. Uh, you know, super. <laughs> Yeah, I'll post a really ugly one later. Don't worry. I think I got an ugly one on mine. It ain't pretty. <laughs> uh, Ryan, do you have anything to say about you? Do a lot of dry fire. I mean, what do you? Yeah, do? I do. Um, you know, I do from holster. I do, um, you know, one hand things like that. And then I also like I'll stare at the wall and then draw, looking at the wall, and then as I fire, seeing where my sight was compared to where I was trying to line up my vision to see how well my hand goes with my uh, line of sight. And then I'll also, like, sitting in front of the TV, I'll just um, manipulate the trigger very slowly to get used to the break and, um, you know, the reset and things like that. Because, like, my girlfriend's newer to shooting, so when I tell her about it, you know, I say, you want to get to the point where when you're pulling the trigger, you're not waiting for it to break. You're knowing when it's going to break because that's going to help you with your accuracy. You're not doing that last-minute jolt of, you know, pulling the hand down. So I think it's more of just familiar, your, familiarizing yourself with the gun from pulling it from holster and from the trigger and all that stuff. It'll just make you a better shooter in general. Yep. Uh, Rex, did you have anything to say on that? Uh, I'm no expert like those two. Uh, my dry fire drills are, I go slow. Uh, I still don't don't rush. I try to do the, the two-second thing. I did a post about it the other day where, you know, I start at two seconds, and I try to intentionally go slow so that my trigger pull is exactly when that two-second beep goes off. And then I'll just work my way down as I feel comfortable. And I try to do that, you know, at least once a day, but I'm not religious about it. Yeah. Uh, Travis Haley just put out a great video. Now, it wasn't dry fire, but it was on the range. And he starts out at five seconds. So he'll set his par time at five seconds, and he will literally go that slow and on the fifth second shoot that shot. And... That's what he does three or four times, and then he'll work his way down from that. It was a great video. If any of you out there get a chance to see it, go on YouTube. It's uh, Travis Haley, um, and he's on the range, and it's kind of his warm-up, so to speak. But it is a great video if you guys get a chance. Uh, Noah, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I think that's all of the questions that we had. Uh, um, the uh, Real quick, how often do you guys, uh, you know, with the responsibility side of the uh, carrying a firearm, things like that. How often do you, outside of the dry fire, get, actually get to the range? Uh, um, Drew, it's not really fair, but uh, um, <laughs> how often do you get to the range? How often do you think you should get to the range? And then after that, I really want to know how uh, how often you train with that axe that's hanging behind your Rex. <laughs> 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 Rex, how, how often do you get to the range? Not enough, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, it depends. Because, you know, where I live, there's not a lot of formal um, formal ranges. And so I always have to ask, like, friends, like, hey, can I go shoot on your property? So yeah. it's anywhere from once a month to I might get lucky and get to go two or three times a month. It's, it's not enough. If not, I have to drive an hour and a half to a range. Jeez. Yeah, that Ooh. sucks. That is nice. So Drew, I do a lot of drop fire. <laughs> Drew, instead of uh, telling us how often you get to the range, just turn around and shoot that rubber dummy right now. <laughs> shoot it right in the face. I could. I don't have any iPro. And <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, oh, man. All right. Oh, the cruise pod. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. Ryan, how often do you get to the range? Uh, I'd say probably a couple times a month. Um, you know, we have a indoor range that's probably a couple miles from me, but I do not, I do not like going to indoor ranges where you can't draw from concealment. Uh, and we're we're having a video coming out on that, actually. But, yeah, sorry, go on. Yep, and um, so I go to a range where I can put the rubber dummy out close, far, draw from, you know, appendix or whatever, you know, I'm training in that day. Because I'm not going to go and spend $30, $50 on ammo just to stand and shoot at a target. That's yeah, not, why, that's why not realistic. You? And to me, you know, with my pistol, accuracy isn't hitting a golf ball at 15 yards. You know, accuracy is hitting a human body or, you know, similar size shape quickly and ef efficiently. You know, I'm not trying to be a marksman when it comes to my pistol, so I'm not going to go stand inside a loud range, just shoot a target over and over again. That it doesn't do anything for me. Turn Except around, shoot, you learn shoot your, your rubber dummy right now. Shoot it. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> I shot a gun in the apartment one time. My girl lost it, so I can't be doing that anymore. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, Noah, so, do you have any more, more yeah, questions? Yeah, real quick then. Um, this is also – I was actually going to bring this up, but EDC Training just posted another question and wanted to know rubber dummy versus steel. Um, that's actually going to be his next purchase, and so he's looking question. for a little, uh, a little feedback on that. Yeah, I want to know you that answer to, too. Yeah. <laughs> Drew, do you you got yeah. both right now. What do you I mean? What do you what do you think? Um, I would say if you had to choose between the two, if you didn't have either one, go steel. If you already have at least one piece of steel, get a rubber dummy as opposed to getting more steel. Just because um, what it provides me is the ability to um, really change up and to transition uh, the the styles of shooting. So. And plus, it's fun. Like, let's face it, I think uh, that anything yeah. you go out to the range, you need to have fun. Whatever you're passionate about, have fun with it. Um, don't make it a job. Um, you can get better at your craft and still have fun. So the rubber dummy does that for me. Um, it's good for shooting close up. It's good for shooting from closer tension and then transitioning to something further away, um, which is what I enjoy doing. So, um, so yeah, I would say go steel if you don't have it. Get a rubber dummy if you already have some steel. Okay. Ryan? I, yeah, I, I like what Drew said, but I think it depends on the style of shooting you do, where I think when I go to the range, a lot of my practice is for close, so I think a rubber dummy is awesome for that, because rubber dummy gives you instant feedback of you know shot placement and all those things, close, but if you start to shoot far, it, it you know you can't see it as clearly, and with steel, it's nice to get the ring so you know what you're doing, Right. Um, so I think it depends on the style of shooting you like. The one thing I really like about both of them is you don't have to worry about bringing stuff to the range because all you have to do is either throw the steel or throw the rubber dummy in the car, go to the range, set it up, and you have a target for the whole extent of your shooting. You know, Outside of spray painting the rubber dummy, you don't have to rehang anything, you don't have to redo anything, and they both give you good feedback. So for me, I'd do rubber dummy over steel just because I think it's more fun, um, but that's just because of the yeah. style of shooting I do. If I can do kind of a plug right now, I mean, I'd recommend, if you're going to do steel, get uh, TA Targets. They make some great steel. Um, it's pretty innovative how they put it together. Lasts a long time. Everyone says, like, well, I don't really care about the fit and finish on my steel because I'm going to shoot it up. But these guys care, and they put fit and finish to everything they do. Uh, Noah and I have been shooting their targets for a couple months, and they're well-priced, and they're... They're they're holding up great. So I mean, TA we've targets. we've shot. I can't even imagine how many thousands of rounds. Yeah. Just Ben and I, plus them, and I mean, we've shot. God knows, like things that we shouldn't be at them. Yeah. And we haven't <laughs> broke. And we haven't broke them. Um, and they ring like a church bell when oh, you hit yeah. them. Like awesome. it's not that. Very it's awesome. not just that dunk that you get. I mean, which is awesome, but. It's not that, I mean, at 440 yards on a windy day, uh, uh, you can still hear those suckers ring. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's what, if you shoot a lot of ARs, a rubber dummy is kind of pointless for you because you're not going to want to shoot that close most of the time, and you're not going to see, you're not going to get the feedback you want from it. But if you're right. shooting close, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, your bullet impact and stuff like that as you would with steel with the rubber dummy. So it's, you know, it all depends on what you do. Okay, very cool. All right, Noah. Anything else? Uh, I, EDC training just said, "Man, you got, got gave me nothing there. I need a tiebreaker." So, uh, um, well, I got a tiebreaker. Drew and I both have a rubber dummy in the background, so that's two to one on steel. He's only got steel. I don't have steel. So. If he has to travel any at all in order to get to a range, I would have to side with Ryan and go the rubber dummy. It's lighter. It's easier to pack around. Um, and yeah, if you're traveling to a range, you know, definitely go rubber dummy. And I know cost. I know some like good steel targets cost more than a rubber dummy too. So, what uh, what, what does a rubber dummy cost, by the way? Like, what is the going rate? Yeah, it's two hundred for a starter package, which is essentially. Gosh, I should get a free one out of this. Yeah, we <laughs> should get rubber. You get send rubber dummy, dummy to my house, you get please. The dummy and you get the stand that it comes on. It comes with a can of spray paint, which actually lasts a very long time. Yeah. Um, and it comes with like ten of the uh, red powder packs. The brain. So for two hundred. You got a dummy that's going to take, and this one has, like I said earlier, 10,000 rounds in it, and it's barely beginning to show wear. Like his nose is gone, and that's it. So, okay, cool. Very that's cool. actually comparable for uh, a TAT rifle ADAP system. Uh, price-wise, yeah. Price-wise, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So, so price wise, for uh, again for the steel that we're shooting, which frankly we've shot a lot of different steel, really is just up there um, as far as quality. Uh, and the nice thing with their ADAP system is that you can still also put scoring targets. Their their stands actually allow you to put scoring targets in front of your steels, and because of the movement on their uh, um, the spall is dropping and not even tearing up your targets. So right, so you get visual but, and audible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think for Ben and I, like we're probably looking at adding a rubber dummy because we, I mean, but we have a whole freaking range of steel that we have access to, so. I go shooting with my girlfriend a lot, and like I said, she's newer to it, so I like that she can get the closer feedback, um, you know, so it's just better for our style, but steel's pretty badass, especially in videos, because you can hear the <laughs> thing, and like, Drew's videos are badass, I'm like, man, I gotta get some steel. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a safety element to the rubber dummy as well, though, because if you, yeah. know, you don't know what you're doing, and you shoot steel targets too close, I mean... Well, and also, poor steel. Uh, steel gets kind of a bad rap because there's an awful lot of people out there that go, oh, jeez, I, I can cut up some steel and, and make in some targets garage. and do that. And uh, uh, we were just at a, at a steel shoot uh, the other day, and we were 60 yards away behind a berm, and I don't know what this company had done that they were using, but we were getting spall hitting the roof, uh, um, 60 yards away over a berm. And, See, that's, uh, that's sketchy. Uh, yeah, you can hear it sprinkling down. <laughs> and so, so bad steel gives steel a bad rap, uh, and, and so that's why make sure you really do your research if you're going to buy steel. Like, get good steel. Make sure that they can provide you with the certificates that it's actually AR five hundred. Yeah. Uh, um, and because again, even with AR five hundred, we found this out working with with TA targets. Uh, they even had some come in that was a Brunel hardness that was only 474 instead of wow. 490 or better. And uh, it, it... Oh, Noah, come on. Are you dog again? Fill in the blank. All right, yeah, so they had some seal that was subpar, but you got to get that certificate. you got to get it checked out. Um, some companies don't do that. They're cutting yeah. it in their garage, and it's just not up to snuff, and then you get accidents from that kind of steel. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. If, if Drew doesn't get out of here, hey, what the? <laughs> if Drew doesn't get out of here, he's probably going to get a divorce, so uh, we got to get at him out of here on time. Um, do any of you have any last thoughts or words you'd like to say before it's done? I mean, uh, if you could, just go down and just tell everyone your IG handle so they can find you on IG, um, and they can ask you questions there. Rex, go ahead. Where can they find you at? Uh, you can find me at Kane Tucky Carey, uh, C A N E T U C K E E and C A R O Y. Very cool, Drew. Drew Hopkins on Instagram, B R E W H O P K I N S. And Ryan, embrace the recoil. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. We hope to do this a lot more. Uh, my name is Ben with Wise Men Company. We appreciate you tuning in for this, and uh, we'll see you on the next video.